Hello, Guardians. Welcome back to Tower Casuals, the Destiny podcast. I am one of your hosts, Corey Deering, and alongside me, as always, is the man who just relived my past, Josh Finney. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hi, Josh. Hi, Corey. Oh, we just got done talking It's been about a week. It. Oh, my God. You are fucking telling me. It's, Maybe It's been a week. <sighs> For both of us, it's been a week. God. I have been in a war of attrition with a cricket for uh, the past four days. Hmm. I, um, I've i been haunted by a person of my past, so that was fun. Yeah, Corey, Corey's haunted by something that's like actually important. I'm just going insane because of a fucking well, cricket that's in my air vent somewhere. Uh, important is a little bit of a strong word, Josh. It's, um... I, uh, I, I have, I have, Corey, I have ripped the vents off the wall. I was shining flashlights in there. I was smacking things around in those vents trying to get this cricket to shut the fuck up because let me tell you something i'm fighting a war with this cricket okay that i cannot find in any of my air vents anywhere and i know for a fact it's in the air vents because it Mm. echoes through there can't find it that's really bothering me two i have fucking wisdom tooth coming in that's hurting and three still dealing with a uh with a sore tooth that i'm supposed to get a root canal on in a few days and i am just like ready to climb the fucking walls because I can't sleep because I, I'm just I'm irritated. The noise is killing me. Mm. So uh, to answer Cade's question right off the bat, it's not that's going funny. well. Mm. Have you won the battle with said cricket that's been plaguing you the last few nights? Fuck no, I haven't. I thought I declared I declared victory last night because I heard it and I just went up and I literally I like I put on a work glove and just started punching the main air vent. You're punching the air vent, huh? I was punching the main air vent. It really hurt my hand. Ooh. And then it stopped, and I didn't hear it the rest of the night. And it was like, oh, thank God. I think I finally won. It's been starting around like 7.30, 8 o'clock every night. It started at 4.45 this afternoon. Oh. I was like, oh, oh, you want to do this? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come out sooner. I'll come out sooner. But um, I, uh, like, I, I had my cat up there as like a periscope. Like, tell me if you see it. <laughs> like uh, my cat was very upset that that's what I was choosing to do at three o'clock in the morning to stick his head up there in the uh, in the uh, vents. I mean, I don't know if anybody would have been happy with their head in a vent at three o'clock in the morning. Let me tell I, you, uh, I did apologize to my upstairs neighbor because um, when I started punching the vent last night, I heard them like stomping on the ground right above, like right above my bedroom, mm. really loudly. Not that they haven't been loud in the past, but I. Uh, I went up and left them a note today, and I was like, "Sorry, fighting a cricket. That's a, uh, sorry for the noise. I'm fighting a cricket, essentially." Mm. Um, I I could tell when they got the note because I could hear laughing. Mm. Uh, that's usually when uh, you know, somebody realizes they got something that is kind of funny. So, I mean, yes. to be fair, you watching you and a cat fight a cricket seems really hilarious. Yeah, sleep deprived at like three, four o'clock in the morning, and we're doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, my vent punching happened at like nine, ten o'clock at night, though. So you know, mm. yeah. Anyways, the bottom line is this cricket's driving me up a fucking wall. Mm. Much like the legend title in this game. Mm. How's that going for you, Josh? I finished it. So I finished it, and I, I want everybody to know I took a bullet for the team here. I finished it. I finished the Skywatch part of it, at least. And immediately after I finished, you know what they announced? What? We are double. We are going to increase the rate of Ingram drops and enemy density hmm. in the Skywatch for the next three weeks. So I did this. I made this happen for y'all. I want you to know that. Hmm. Good job, Josh. There is no better way to commemorate the 10th anniversary of Destiny than a mind-numbing, horrible grind. Hmm. But you know what? It was worth it. I got my seal ordered. I got my Ace of Spades nerf gun ordered. Nice. So uh, I'm very excited. I saw a picture of that thing in person. That thing is fucking huge. Yeah. I think we forget how big hand cannons actually are. They're not pistols. Pistols are sidearms. Yeah. This thing's a fucking unit, dude. Yeah, it's big. It's huge. It's like it's legitimately it's probably the size of the uh, of the needler I have on the shelf behind me. Mm hmm. So I don't know where I'm going to put this thing. I thought it was a lot smaller. I'm actually going to probably have to hang it on the wall somewhere because I just don't have. I was going to set it like off to the side on my desk and I just don't have room for it. 
So that's uh, that's me griping about, you know, I had money to spend. Yeah. Well, you know. So, you know, what what what, what what's another what's what's another toy? At yeah, this I know. Point? I I get it. I um have been uh speaking of toys, I've been staring at this uh Crow and, Ma- and Mara statue. I so, I'm waiting for a sale. I, the Savathun statue has gone down deep enough recently a few times that the it was next time $40 at one point then it was down to 94 at one point and I did not pull the trigger oh man if it dips below 100 I'm buying I'm pulling the trigger I'm, yeah. I'm buying it I'm pulling the trigger the deal I'm gonna have to make is that I'm never buying another one of these until they do Mithrax but I like I have nowhere to put this I don't even know if I have room for the box mm. but if it goes below 100 I'm buying it I, I believe you will find somewhere to put it, Josh. Uh, yeah, it's going to be my storage unit. Mm. Mm. I'm trying to see what's on your shelf back there. There's books back there. You can move some of those books. Oh, my God, dude. I have three shelves completely full of books. I have two in here and one out in the living room. <laughs> I have another one in the living room that's just uh, Blu-rays. You could uh, you could put it in that chair behind you, that rocking chair. <laughs> you know what? I actually probably would. Chelsea doesn't use it, so... I uh, probably put just put it on the cat's climbing post. He doesn't yeah. need that. Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fun. Cat climbs up there and sees Savathun there and just falls off. It'll be oh fun. Oh my god, it'll be a good time. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm definitely like running out of because like I have all sorts of stuff back there. Up above my desk is even worse. Mm. That's where like most of the stuff that's like in boxes is. So it's like all stacked on top of each other. Mm. Yes. So and I have a lot of my like seal pins on like little small shelves I have around the desk. So yeah, I'm running out of room for for this stuff though. My my time of buying Destiny collectibles may be coming to a very very rapid end. Mm. Um, every time I say that though, they announce something really cool. So yeah, hey, I've... I just said that. That probably means that they're gonna do something cool here in like the next month or two. Yeah, my uh, I've I've decided to just limit myself to this to the statues, the character statues. God, they're so good, too. I know the Mara one looks weird. I'm not going to lie to you, but maybe that's just like the one image looks weird. It's just like it looks unfinished. (laughs) It's too smooth. (laughs) Her face is just too smooth or something. I don't know what it is, man. But Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know how I like my Mara super smooth, Josh. <laughs> you, have a you have so many problems. <laughs> oh, don't get me started. We already discussed <laughs> too many of them. So, oh, Josh, we should start a therapy podcast. My therapy podcast. I mean, I have a lot of shit to go to get out. <laughs> Uh, Josh, be my therapist. I'll pay you in silver. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Good times. Good times. I did not complete the legend thing. I've been playing the Plucky Squire. Uh, Which is a much more divisive game than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's, um... Like, I saw perfect scores rolling in, and then I saw, like, actual, like, your outlets doing scores and it was like oh oh yeah i mean okay. it's it's got some charm i gotta tell you it's it's got a lot of charm but it also um it's got it's got its issues but it's it's a it's a it's a cute game uh it's not gonna win any game of the year awards but uh you know i would i'm hoping to finish it before zelda comes out next week because uh once i start zelda i'm never touching this game again <laughs> i'm gonna be honest with you but um, I like it. It's fine. it's on PS Plus. It sure is. I bought it on Switch though, because I don't have time for PS Plus, man. I don't have time to turn my PlayStation on. I forgot that I had PS Plus until it auto renewed, which is really mm-hmm. funny. Um, I I have been, you know, you guys heard me last week crusading against the uh, PS Five Pro. I'm not gonna lie. Today they damn near got me. Mm. I don't need that console, which the special version of that is almost certainly going to be a little over a thousand dollars after tax. Mm. Um, but I am going to cop one of those controllers. 
Yeah, the thirtieth anniversary controller is really sexy. the The controllers are sexy. I the packaging may be the best part of all of this. Yeah, isn't it all based off like the original PlayStation yeah. packaging? It's all OG PlayStation packaging, and then the uh, the charging cable for the controller that comes with the PS5 Pro is the uh, it looks like the old memory card adapter. Yeah, it looks great. Th- this this looks awesome. Um, I. Would really love to be able to fork out the money, but I'm just gl- I'm so glad Sony has really nailed these special controllers because I mean Xbox has been doing this for years, right? Like Xbox yeah. has been making good special controllers since the 360 days. Yeah, and we just really we didn't get any that I think were like super standout during the PS4. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a couple of them that came with like the consoles, but that was about it. Um, but just just this year alone. Concord, Astrobot, and now the 30th anniversary controllers have all looked awesome. So yeah. I, I think this is great. I'm always for stuff like that too. That Astrobot controller is pretty awesome. Yeah. Impossible so, fine, but it's awesome. Yeah. Um I used it at PAX to play Astrobot. I felt like I was really in the zone. You know, really in the world of Astrobot at PAX. Play an Astrobot with the Astrobot controller, let me tell you. I, uh, I I know we're going to get into Destiny here, but uh, I played one of the games I've been wanting to play all year because it was for, it's 40% off this week. That's the whole reason I'm bringing this up. Prince of Persia Ooh. is phenomenal. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I got about an hour and a half of it in uh, last night and today, and uh, it, it is it is challenging. Yeah, that is maybe it's just because I'm getting older and my reaction times aren't what they used to be. But uh, oh, man. This is this is a great modern Metroidvania. Like this, I love and, the map uh, system. This and Metroid Dread are like two of the best you can play right now. Yeah, I love the uh, map pinning system. Yeah, I found that interesting that you could uh, you can basically create a memory so you can see exactly why you pinned that on the map. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was cool. Um, the I, I think that the the backtracking of it all is interesting. I I like the combat. I just think that like I'm playing it on a lower difficulty, and I still think it's like a little like not forgiving. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is it is definitely a challenge of a game, but it is it's fun. Yeah, it it evokes more Hollow Knight than Metroid or Castlevania vibes for me, with like a little bit of Dead Cells sprinkled in. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I would say the combat is almost like explicitly like Dead Cells. Yeah. So yeah, the combat's really good. It, it's re- it's really good. Um, I'm hoping that it's not too long of a play. Um, um, I don't. I think it's like. I think you could probably get through it in like twelve or fifteen hours. I think, and then uh, like the hundred percent is like twenty five or thirty or something. I don't think it's that long. So, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I love it. I think it's great. Uh, how long to beat.com says if you play the main story and you are not a completionist, 16 and a half hours on average, that is excellent length for a $40 game. Yeah. Um, which I, and I only paid, um, $21, I think for it. Yeah. So, uh, because I got the sale price and then I got a game pass discount on top of that. So very good game. It's funny enough. That is longer than any of the other Prince of Persia games. Yeah. Sands, Sands of time is, uh, it's about a 10 hour game. Same with, uh, two thrones, uh, warrior within is the longest one in the series. I think forgotten Sands is only an eight hour game. Yeah. This is, uh, this is the longest one, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, I mean, games have to be long apparently now. So, yeah. yeah. And at least like in the early hours, it doesn't feel too obnoxious. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what tur- that's what's turned me off to a lot of like modern Metroidvanias is those games don't need to be super long. Mm-mm. They need to be engaging something I can do in like one, two play sessions. I think that's why I loved Tunic so much. Yeah. Like Tunic is a fascinating game, and I'll, I'll save a lot of these thoughts for Xbox Casuals on Monday. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely on my list. It's on my list of my favorite games of the year already. Yeah, it's uh, d- it'll probably end up on my top ten, but at the end of the year, to be honest. Yeah, it'll it'll probably be towards like the back of my top ten. 
because honestly, the games I have played, I've been like that I've finished the completion, I've been really impressed by. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's still, God, dude, there's like five or six major releases coming that I still need to play. (laughs) That if they if they hold up to what previews are, like they will all hit my top ten, and that's you know, and Astrobot, Metaphor. Indiana Jones, Life is Strange, Dragon Age, which got phenomenal previews today. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, Vessel of Hatred is just a couple weeks away as well. So I'm very excited. Yeah. But you guys are not here to hear me listen to listen to me talk about Prince of Persia. You are here about Destiny. We are here for Destiny. This is Tower Casuals, the Destiny uh, podcast. Yeah, here, here we are 15 minutes into the show, finally getting to the Destiny of it all um that's not new though no it's point. not but uh <laughs> we uh we do have some uh we have some interesting changes here uh this is actually a pretty beefy job which i was not expecting yeah um so let's uh let's let's go ahead and uh go on through this uh next wednesday on the 25th there's going to be a new article about frontiers a dev insights uh it will be, uh, they, they don't really say what it's going to be about. Um, it just says, new article delivered directly by Destiny 2 developers focusing on answering some questions you all have about Frontiers. We'll see what's actually in that. I'm not expecting much substance to this, honestly. Yeah. Um, we are still nine months out from release. I wouldn't even expect to hear a real name for this until Heresy releases. Um, like I would, I would venture to say that the day that heresy releases, they do a showcase for Apollo for the first time. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll definitely cover that next week. Uh, upcoming rewards changes with Revenant. Oh boy. So (laughs) I love, I love starting out like that. I, I love starting out like that. I actually really like, uh, what this, what this is talking about. Um, Drop chances for non-adept weapons have been increased in advanced expert and master nightfalls when earning platinum and gold tier completions. With this change, non-adept nightfall weapons are now guaranteed to drop when completing a platinum run and a master nightfall and a 50% chance to drop if it's a gold completion. Really like that change. Uh, Adept weapon drops from grandmaster nightfall has been slightly increased when getting gold completions, although platinum remains the best course of action. Um, I, with the exception of a few very tricky champs that just like to teleport away or despawn you should be getting platinum on every run anyways Uh Uh, just because otherwise they usually repeat as shreds um and then there's gonna be a change with nightfall focusing uh the weekly nightfall weapon uh is going to cost one vanguard ingram and one nightfall cypher Uh, of course you have to have it unlocked and then the featured adept nightfall weapon one ingram fifty thousand glimmer 10 nightfall ciphers um i like this this is a little bit cheaper than it is currently um in terms of the engrams i kind of wish it was taking effect this week so i could take advantage of it for slammer but uh so be it uh i like that and then uh, they're gonna buff lost sector rewards also uh world pool weapons will be farmable in lost sectors the very season they're added to the game previously you had to wait till the next season or episode to get them this way uh, weapon availability availability will rotate daily, uh, but there are four new weapons being added to the world loot pool next season. Um, some of the other weapons you can still go and get uh, include um, the uh, Mikado 45, uh, the Truth Teller, uh, Rasarago 4. Uh, funny enough, I'm looking at this and I am not... Uh, Crux Termination is still in there. I'm not seeing... Um, I'm forgetting the name of it uh, off the top of my head, but I'm not seeing the uh, the solar pistol that we all like, the solar sidearm we all like so much on here. So uh, that if that is no longer farmable in here, that could be interesting. Um, kind of have to rely on Banshee and decoding the Banshee Ingrams. Uh, but yeah, just some really quick economy changes there. I think the bigger news uh, really comes uh, with the next one. Power uh, Power levels are going to go up. Not by much, but they're going to increase by 10, which is going to happen again in Heresy um, to get some pursuit for endgame players in here, essentially, is what they say. Um, I like that. I'm a fan. I do think that 
that gives you, like they say, that gives you value to completing raids, dungeons, grandmasters, things like that. Uh, fire team power is still there, but for those who just do you want to do nothing but play Destiny, there you go. You got a new grind. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally think the pinnacle. I think the pinnacle grind should always be there every season for those who do nothing but play this game. I don't know why you wouldn't do that. I don't think we should be worried about power creep at all. Ten, ten, ten light is not going to make a huge difference. So uh, I do like that. But the uh, the bigger, more meaningful changes. There are a lot going on here with all of the classes. Jesus Christ! Specifically, Titans are getting an awful lot of stuff here from the combat gameplay team. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, that I, I prepared a drink, and I don't know if I have a big enough drink for this. The, there's a lot. Do we need to pause so you can make a bigger one, Josh? No, I ha- I have uh, I have roughly 16 ounces of tea here. I think I'll be okay. But I'm gonna. <laughs> I drink a lot of water this afternoon, and I drink uh, I downed uh, a bottle of uh, uh, electrolytes too. Like I I'm not even kidding. Like I uh, seriously, I was like I was feeling really dehydrated this afternoon. It was a very hot September afternoon, uncharacteristically hot for us. We hit a hundred today. Ooh. Um, we've hit a hundred the last couple days. We're all just like kind of hold, holding out hope until uh, next week when it's supposed to cool off for good. We're supposed to get several days of rain, hopefully next week. But uh, yeah, so uh, when it's hot outside, my apartment gets uh, gets a little toastier. Uh, and I was out and about most of the day today. So uh, being out in the sun, I got to make it to Monday. I got to make it to Monday. That's when it's going to finally cool off, which. Unfortunately, it means I need to go grocery shopping on like Sunday. <laughs> I don't want to be out in the rain grocery shopping. Yeah. That's like my biggest first world problem. I don't like going grocery shopping in the rain. I don't like going grocery shopping at all. <laughs> I do all I do all of our grocery shopping and I do the vast majority of our cooking. So, uh, all right. Titan class identity reinforcement is a big thing that's being pushed this week. Titans are the bulwarks of their fire team. Sure. In a world without well, sure. Uh, <laughs> Titans deserve a class identity that's more than the sum of its fists. We've heard your cries for more depth to Titan gameplay and more viability in high tier end game content, and we agree. Titans have so much more to give than blunt force trauma. They're frontliners, damage mm-hmm. mitigators, and battlefield commanders. Eh, okay, let's not let's not blow a one Johnny's head up too much here. Look, I, um, I, I love the Titan as much as anybody, but even I know it's like... Mm. <laughs> we want to find on. non-destructive ways to add deaths to Titans, but these kinds of shifts take time. We're starting down that road with Revenant. Starting with Revenant, we're testing a change to barricades and other shields that will give Titans more of a traditional tank role. Titan Barricade now taunts enemies in front of the barricade. The taunt only occurs when there is a player standing behind the barricade. This is a substantial change for Titans and Destiny. For the first time, Titans can use their defensive abilities to draw enemy fire, therefore shielding their fire team from harm. The Unbreakable Shield and Sentinel Shield Guard also will taunt enemies, allowing you to become a mobile aggro magnet. This change plays well. We're hoping to add this functionality to more of the defensive abilities, such as Ward of Dawn in the future. I really love this. This feels like a no-brainer. How did we take 10 years to get to this point? This feels like it's funny because like it's something that feels so easy to say, and we're like, oh, you know, I'm I'm doing it right now. Like, oh, oh, we could have had this like forever ago, but like, it's one of those things that's so obvious that like you don't think to do it. I think in in a lot of ways, this is cool though. I really love the idea of doing it for Ward of Dawn if this plays well on a smaller scale first. Yeah. Um. So, big fan. Uh, again, A1 Johnny, one of the only people I know who actually enjoys using Big Shield. Um, very, very excited for him to be able to draw some aggro um, and get like, get the boss to fucking face us while we're using it. Um, enemies will typically prioritize bringing down the barricade above all else. There are combat situations where combatants may have higher priorities than the barricade, such as a wyvern 
with a directive to march towards a conflux or a legionary desperately trying to bring down a guardian in their super. The taunt doesn't turn enemies into mindless zombies and enemies who are on a mission may prioritize the mission over the barricade. But for general rank and file enemies you see in activities from patrols to raids, this has been quite fun in the playtests. One important detail about this change is the combatants now shoot at the barricade itself instead of at guardians behind the barricade, making aiming at enemies from behind your barricade safer than before. To support the new aggro lifestyle, here are the changes to barricades and unbreakable. Towering barricade and rally barricade across all subclasses. Reduce non-boss combatant damage dealt to the barricade by 50%. Increase splash damage reduction from combatants for players behind the barricade from 20% to 60%. Very excited about that. Barricades now grant moderate damage resistance versus combatants during cast animation. And then unbreakable. Oh my god, so much here. Damage blocked by Unbreakable now generates grenade energy. Max duration has been increased. Forward movement speed now slows briefly when the shield is shot. Reduced Unbreakable's throw attack damage versus players by 20%. Increased damage bleed through from players by 15 Fully charged Unbreakable attacks will now one-shot barricades in PvP, except when the barricade is under the effect of Heart of Inmost Light. Uh, Void Overshield is also uh, getting a little bit of love here. Uh, PvE damage resistance is going from 50 to 70%, and the maximum effective HP is going up to 150 from 90. Very, 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 very excited for this. Um, I think that th these are common sense changes. Like they said, like you, if you're playing a tank, you're playing that tank fantasy. That's what you're playing as. You're playing as a tank. You're playing as a super soldier. Like... I remember in the very early days when they were first talking about the classes from Destiny, they compared the Titan to Master Chief. Hmm. And yeah. I mean, that's why I picked the Titan. Yeah, this just just this just makes sense. These are things that just make sense, mm -hmm. you know. And I think it's it, it it seems like such a small change. You might be like, "Oh, why is it such why is that such a big deal?" It's adding things to classes without having to wait for a major expansion and that's how the game should evolve we shouldn't have to wait for classes to become more usable for a major expansion these are things that like when they're ready to go if you think they're ready to drop drop them in let us play with them you know i'd rather have it now than when we're preparing for a world's first raid in case something goes wrong so i i'm pretty excited about that prismatic titans will inherit all Applicable changes to Barricade and Breakable and Sentinel Shield. They're also buffing several other abilities featured in the subclass. So they're global, which means they're both on the standard subclass and Prismatic. The biggest one is Consecration. Consecration will Scorch and Slam Waves will now shatter Stasis Crystals. That is super nice for some of those just bitch-ass bosses that love to throw the Stasis Crystals out. Those, those Dread that like to use them. I'm specifically talking about those motherfuckers in the very first uh, cooperative focus mission that like to just throw shitloads of crystals everywhere, and then when they shatter them, you're dead. I'm specifically talking about those motherfuckers here. This is this is great. I, I like this. Uh, diamond lance thrown or slammed. Diamond lances will now shatter stasis crystals. Slamming a lance will grant you and nearby allies two stacks of frost armor. That feels big. That's a big change. I would just be I would just be picking them up and slamming them to the ground, honestly. Give us some extra armor. Why not? Uh, so very, very excited about that. And you now will also be able to see how many seconds are remaining before the Diamond Lance disappears, similar to a Tangle. Um, knockout. Melee, now, melee kills now cancel health and shield stun in addition to healing, allowing you to immediately start regenerating. Uh, this is a revert of a previous nerf that had too much of a negative impact on PvE. So we're just kind of bringing that back to where it should be. Uh, Shiver Strike now attaches a stasis explosive to the target on impact. It will slow players, freeze combatants, and refunds 80% melee energy on a whiff. So uh, that is very, very cool. Um, the cooldown for Facet of Command and Echo of Domineering... Uh, has been reduced from 11 seconds to 4 seconds. Um, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And then the unpowered melee uh, from Titans. Increased damage against players by 5%. Increased damage versus PvE combatants by 20%. And increased stun multiplier. Uh, I do agree with the logic here that they should punch 
harder than the other classes. I do get that. I think that's going to be really frustrating, but that continues that really that plays into like, oh, the Titan. Like, I don't I don't know if anybody's going to be changing to play a Titan based just off of that in Crucible. Like, I imagine that's still going to be pretty much Hunterland. But this definitely for like things like Mayhem, um, for Momentum, for like, you know, Zone Capture, things like that. Titan definitely a little bit of a viable option. You could just how many times have you gone to punch somebody and it just hasn't done enough to kill them? They have yeah. that little bit of health left. Well, now you got your answer. So five percent, I don't think is a huge deal. Uh, very interested in that twenty percent though. I really like that against the PVE combatants. I think that's cool because I mean I can't tell you the amount of times I've been playing high end activities with John where he's just going bonk, 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 bonk. And granted, that's usually him throwing his hammer, but like, God forbid that uh, that he can't pick up the hammer, then it's just punch, 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 punch. There you go, John. 20% extra damage just for you, baby. Just for you. Just for you. Uh, Corey, you are our resident Titan player. What are you feeling about this? You, you digging this? I mean, uh, what's, I'm how, inter- how are we feeling about this? I'm interested to see how these changes really work in theory in in action right like i mean it always sounds either really good or scary on paper but i think once you get out there and and start using these things and you know using them in practice especially in in harder activities like it'll really show what's worth keeping and what's might need tooled but i think you know some of this stuff is uh especially somebody who likes to um, run around and punch people. Uh, the melee sounds fun. Um, and, you know, a lot of these other things seem like pretty decent changes overall, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. I like the barricade stuff. Uh, the barricade stuff is awesome. Barricade. Love it. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of ex- excited for this. So. Yeah, I think the barricade changes are are the bigger deal. I like them. I'm more excited that they're looking to add more functionality to Ward of Dawn. Yeah. I think that's the bigger one for me because, I mean, yeah, hey, a big-ass bubble should draw aggro. I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. Um, and you're not supposed to camp out inside the bubble anyways. You're supposed to just sprint through it. So, hey, if they're focused on that, great. You can you can be clearing enemies. You can be clearing uh, red, uh, red and orange bars while other people are trying to do DPS and things like that. Like, it's, it's great. I like it. Um, all right. It's fitting that we have a picture of the Ark Warlock here with the caption unlimited power. Um, there is, uh, there, there's some super abilities that are being buffed across the, uh, across the globe for everybody. Warlocks are going to see increased damage resistance, uh, by 5% from 53% to 58% while using storm trance. Chaos Reach damage resistance is going to go up by 10% from 45 to 55. Um, and uh, fixed uh, some issues where uh, it would not go through Sentinel Shield Guard or uh, Sight and Barricades. Um, and then Nova Warp increased PVE damage by 20%. Damage resistance goes up 7% from 51 to 58%. And now any Nova Warp detonation applies volatile regardless of charge duration. Uh, that could make this really fun. I don't know how viable that's going to be in like higher end PVE, but I think that could be fun in you know some season in seasonal activities and especially uh, in things like uh, Iron Banner. I think that could be really fun. Uh, yeah, hunters are going to see uh, Golden Gun Marksman and Deadshot increase damage against based elite and mini boss combatants by thirty percent. Uh, Spectral Blades are going to see an increase in PvE damage by 20%, and damage resistance is going to go from 47% to 58%. 11% more damage Ooh. resistance. Um, I, I think that for a lot of us, Spectral Blades became kind of unusable a long time ago, unless you have very specific exotics, um, or you're just really fucking good with them. I was never good with, uh, with the Arc Knives in uh, D1, so I kind of feel like I was never meant to succeed with Spectral Blades, funny enough. Mm. Uh, but uh, so those of us who played PvP during Forsaken are still very triggered thinking about the activation sound for uh, Spectral Blades. Mm. 
<laughs> and then Titans. Oh boy, Titans have a lot of stuff here. Glacial Quake. Howl of the Storm can now be used while Glacial Quake is active. Twilight Arsenal. This is the one I'm, I'm really happy to see here. Throne Axe projectiles are now consistently uh, tracking towards targets closer to the reticle and increase the Axe Relic weapon damage versus combatants by 23%. Absolutely fucking love this. Uh, John loves to run this. That thing's burst damage is just a godsend in higher end content. Very, very excited for it to get buffed by almost 25% is fucking wild. Especially yeah. if, you know, we can pass off the buffs to him, you know, making him radiant and whatever, making him radiant, giving him some protection, things like that makes it even better. Or, you know, we can proc volatile on a target right off the bat then, you know, he's absolutely cooking at that point. Love seeing that. Thunder Crash increased the base detonation damage by 33%. Really love that. Uh, Fist of Havoc is getting uh, damage resistance increase from 51 to 58%, uh, and slightly increased the uh, light r attack lunge range and the ability to target enemies vertically. Uh, so I think that is very, very interesting. Um... And then it says, here's our final note. Act 2 of Revenant, we're investigating increasing roaming super uptime, so they're more often available when you need them. Interested to see what exactly that means. Um, because yeah. I'm... I think it's like, so that if you go and activate it, maybe there's a way to like get out of the animation or something without having to have a specific exotic. Because how many times have we gone to activate a super and then an immune shield goes up? You know? Or just yep. like tons of red bars start throwing themselves, red and orange bars start throwing themselves in front of the boss, Mr. Get Down, Mr. President style. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. It's not fun for anybody. None of us enjoy it. I... I think this is this is going to be fun. I, I really specifically out of all of these love the changes to Twilight Arsenal and Thunder Crash. I think those are the two biggest ones. If I had to call out a third one, Nova Warp, I think has a really good change. Um, big fan. Big fan there. Um, but yeah, adding versatility to these kits is something that needs to happen. Uh, Twilight Arsenal really i know it didn't come together at the last minute because we definitely knew about it but man it feels like that one came in real hot out of the new supers um it definitely felt like the i don't want to say the least polished but those projectiles track like ass mm -hmm. they track very badly and i understand like you don't want it to be like a guaranteed one hit kill like there needs to be some sort of aiming but i mean john would go to throw it and it would like curve hard right like it was in fucking wanted. Mm. And it just, oh, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. Nothing more soul crushing than seeing that when you need, uh, when you need the boss damaged in a glass way. Huh. Nothing more soul crushing. Um, Space lightning and sharp knives is the name of our final section here for uh, sandbox updates. Uh, for both storm calling and prismatic warlocks, we want to increase the usability of lightning surge. So you will now have 50% damage resistance versus Titan barricades during the lunge and casting lightning surge also makes you amplified, which makes a lot of sense. All right, here we go. Prismatic oh, hunter, mm. prismatic hunter. The one that, uh, it's the bane of everybody's existence right now. Since the launch of the final shape, Prismatic Hunter has been both a highly used and highly effective subclass according to our data. We've made some PvP-focused changes to Prismatic Hunter abilities during this past season and will continue to monitor its PvP performance and make changes as necessary. In Revenant, we're making the following changes to Hunter, Prismatic Hunter, and Under Hunter subclasses to feature these abilities. Hailfire Spike Prismatic Grenade added projectile tracking and aim assist to insist... <laughs> To increase consistency in hitting targets. Thank God. I can't tell you the amount of times it's just flown through somebody's legs. That and again, soul crushing. You like you you're counting on that damage to like just be there on the ground as a deterrent and it just flies straight through them. Yeah, no. Threaded Spectre. Very excited for this one. Threaded Spectre increased detonation damage against PvE combatants by 33%. Not like it it's you you want the the uh, the threaded spike is what I was thinking of the uh, the melee, but I think th making threaded specter more effective in PVE combat again it kind of plays in with that with the barricade of it all 
You know, if you use your, you can go out there, you can be fighting, you can dodge and get away from the enemies. The enemies are going to be tracked towards both of those, which is great. And I think increasing the size of the detonation and increasing the damage done is, it's a good option because like when I use, when I use my dodge, I use the reload dodges. That's, that's what I like to do. I don't, I don't do the, uh, the quick dodge. I do the reload dodge. Because I want to get back to I want to get back to shooting things, you know. And I know that's not like the traditional way to play hunter, but whatever. That that's how I, that's how I play my subclass. That's how I play. That's how I always play it. I like dodging to reload. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, and then the swarm grenade, swarm grenade sub munitions are now easier for players to shoot down and can now chain detonate other sub munitions when destroyed, which is uh, interesting. I like that you can shoot those apart because how many times again? How many times have you been blocked off from going down a path? In PvP, in a small map, especially because of these little bastards. Mm -hmm. I like it. Big fan. Uh, and then on the PvE side, the combination blow has been a little too hot. So, rescaled healing from a flat 80 HP per kill to 10, 80, 60, 40 per kill based on stat count. No longer clears health and shield stun on kill. Remove the one and a half second inter internal cooldown on healing. So, combination blow is still a really, really good option. Maybe it's not the greatest option. So, uh, wrapping up, we're hard at work on future releases, and we're more optimistic than ever about the future of Destiny and its sandbox. We're excited to take big swings, make drastic changes, deliver new innovations, and in the short term, we hope you're looking forward to revving as much as we are. I'm curious to see how often we're going to get updates. I know that they're saying that for next year's roadmap, um, presumably you're going to get two big updates a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the sandbox changes are going to come with the season launching, and I suspect you'll get a mid-season patch at some point. Mm -hmm. um, maybe when that second little mini content drop happens mm -hmm. um, at the halfway point, maybe that's when you get another one, because hey, that would keep with, oh, every three months we're, we're going to give you sandbox updates. You know, I think 18 weeks is too long to not have updates during these episodes. I, I do think they did a good job of just not waiting until they had a ton of things to roll, just rolling things out as they were ready during Echoes. So, hey, kudos there. You now have 18 weeks of data from the launch of the Final Shape until now to play with. Revenant looks like they've got some great changes lined up. Uh, I'm curious to see what else in the sandbox changes um, with weapons. Hopefully, we get some details on that next week. Uh, we do know there's a few things coming in next week's TWAB. Um, so fingers crossed we get some details there because I'd really like to know kind of what we're building into. I know we're getting the artifact mods, but uh, I'm going to need a little bit more details. I, I want to start start getting ready, start getting prepped. Getting prepped. Start getting prepped. Uh, beyond that, there really is just not... There's not a lot left here. I'm going to be completely honest. Um, we get a cool look at the uh, Ace of Spades. Uh, yeah, that thing, like I said, fucking unit. Uh, very excited. Mine is hopefully, fingers crossed, shipping soon. They are shipping them very quickly. Mm -hmm. People were ordering them, and then they were shipping a day or two later. So I am hoping that mine ships out. Everything else I ordered that day, with the exception of my seal, has already shipped. I got myself one of those uh, Your Light Fades Away shirts. Um, I really, I really love that insignia, uh, the skull and the triangle. I, I've always really liked it. And I missed a chance to get the shirt the first time I was around years and years and years ago. So, uh, happy to get that. Got some armory pins, needed to add them to my pin board. Uh, but still waiting on my, uh, my wonderful, wonderful Ace of Spades to, uh, to ship. I need that thing. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, if you live in Los Angeles or, uh, well, I guess if you have three more days in LA, uh, to go see this, if not, it is going to destiny art show. will be going to New York and London after that. Um, there's an example of some of the pieces that are featured there, uh, different designs of ghosts. I do like a lot of the artwork that is, that is there. I have seen a lot of the pieces, Big fan, I would really love to buy prints of these, but you can only buy them if you went to the art show, apparently. Uh, because they had a lot of the artists there signing stuff, and that's massively frustrating, because they have one specifically, and you can see it in one of these images, that looks like an old-school X-Men comic book cover. 
that I would 100% buy that has uh, Cade, Zavala, and Ikora on it. I would absolutely buy that and frame it. But uh, yeah, a little nice little art show going on. Uh, if you happen to be going to TwitchCon this weekend, which I don't know if anybody is, uh, there is a the Bungie Foundation will be there giving away this sick ass emblem. Uh, I say again, if you go and get me this emblem, you'll be my favorite listener forever. Mm-hmm. I think this emblem is fucking rad. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, um, do 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 do. Ten years of Orbit music. Uh, it is a video that covers a decade of Destiny Orbit music, um, and it's on a loop. Um, it's just a shame that basically everybody who composed that music has been laid off. Mm. So, in case you in case you want to get uh, just absolutely furious about stuff, um, there's a there's a video for you. Um, and that's it. So next week. Be sharing a bit more about the new dungeon, about new artifact perks, what changes we have planned for PvP, new rewards, and more in the coming weeks. Ooh, so, that's exciting. I'm very, very curious to see uh, see what we got coming here. Um, I am stoked for this dungeon. St- I'm still really buzzing over the excitement of there's going to be a contest mode for it. The goal is to get the contest clear. Um, I will be jumping in with Joasis that day, doing the dungeon, and uh, we'll be doing another run with uh, A1 Johnny that night when he gets off work. But I am very, very excited for this. Uh, storing a vampire keep absolutely is something in my uh, wheelhouse. Nice. I, I, I'm excited for this vampire hunting thing. It's going to be awesome gonna be super cool potion craft <sighs> it's gonna be fun good clean fun yep i'm i'm excited i'm excited uh, i got i gotta get more details on that dungeon i'm very excited we're only a couple weeks away october 8th is when the season launches and then the 11th is when we're gonna get the dungeon uh so it's really only about three weeks away um yep yep yep, yep. Yep, we have, three weeks. we have three weeks until uh, three weeks until the dungeon comes out. I'm looking at my calendar right now. Uh, two uh, two episodes, well, three episodes technically, uh, but only two episodes are two two of our episodes remaining until the new season launches. Um, my estimations were off just a little bit, so yeah, we've got we've got two weeks left in the season. Um, man, I, I guess I kind of want to shift talk to the season. Um, I finished up the storyline this week. I gotta confess, I'm <laughs> not super impressed. Um, I was really hoping that we would get some cool revelations, um, and I do think again, I think the dialogue that you get when you go and do the side puzzles and you get the secret chests. And specifically, whenever you're in Maya's lab during the Encore mission, I think all that is great stuff. This final cutscene was maybe the most underwhelming final cutscene of a release since... I mean, I'm going to go all the way back to Shadowkeep. uh, In terms of just like, oh, they bailed out. Like, you confront Maya with Ikora and Saint, and she freezes all three of you, including Ikora, which was really weird to me. It also was kind of weird that she froze the Guardian. Unless you play an Exo, you shouldn't be getting frozen, essentially. Right. Saint breaks out of it. Ikora breaks out of it. We sit there just fucking foaming at the mouth, apparently. <laughs> um, and she gets knocked into the Vex Milk and just disappears. Mm, Vex Milk. I... I, I confess that I'm frustrated with the way that this ended. Um, not just on that front. I mean, very clearly, Maya is not defeated. Maya's gonna come back. I would be very shocked if one of the... If either Apollo or Behemoth was not about Maya's underrush in some way. I'd be very surprised. We've said for a long time that the Vex have to have... It has to have something like the vex have never had a major expansion Mm -hmm. and that's really frustrating when you think about 10 years of destiny and just 
there really hasn't been an amazing Vex story told. Like, there's been one in the background, sure. Like, the story of the Ishtar Collective, the story of Clovis Bray. I wonder if they're struggling to just make it compelling enough. You know, I mean, like... They, the, they've laid so much of the groundwork, though, is the problem. I, I know, I know, but, like, it just feels like... I feel like the it's just that problem of, like, there's an interesting thought there, but how do you make it you know, more focused and interesting. And like, yeah. I don't think Maya Sundaresh is going to be that, unfortunately. I, 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 I So I'm going to respectfully disagree. I think Maya is absolutely, with how insane Maya is now, I think that she's absolutely capable of being that, of being an interesting adversary. And I think that she, bring, putting her in there gives a face to the Vex also. I think that's been one of the hardest things about the Vex is that they don't, they don't talk or like really communicate with us except through like binary languages. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the, one of the great things about last year, you know, when you look at the storylines, I think that it was a pretty rough year for storytelling overall, but there's this kind of through line of the Vex. If you look at, you know, starting with Lightfall, you know, you had, you had Lightfall, you had the Vex Caliber mission during um, Deliverance you had the uh, Wishkeeper mission and the Coil stuff that was going on in uh, Season of the Wish. I think that there, and then, you know, you had the Veil Containment missions. Like, there is, they're clearly trying to establish a Vex story. And Echoes is kind of like the culmination of that in a lot of ways. I do suspect that when we do face off with Maya, because it said, like, oh, Maya fled into the Vex network and this and that. I suspect that Asher will come back into the story in a very real way instead of just like, hey, you had to kind of read between the lines to understand that that's fucking Asher. Mm -hmm. um, and I would expect, assuming he's still around, I would assume Mithrax to be part of that story as well. There's just, there's so many characters. Like Maya actually represents, I think, maybe one of the greater threats that you could be facing. Like it's not a universal threat, but this is a, this is a human mind who went nuts and basically chose to ally with the Vex. Kind of like Clovis Bray. Mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting to bring Bray, Bray Exoscience back into all this. You know, Europa is still there to the Deepstone Crypt is still there. That giant ass portal is still there. There are avenues and like we, like the portal goes to the Vex Forge, you know, it goes to the Vex star. I, I think there are some fascinating ways you could take this. And I think having characters like Maya and Asher within the Vex network give, and Chioma, you know, there's multiple Chiomas, obviously. Um, even though we know Prime Chioma is dead now. She was experimented on uh, because yeah. Maya's nuts. Um, I would say that you have three very compelling characters who I think have been written very well over the years. I just wonder if the story team is up to being able to do that and tell all these other narratives because they're so depleted. Yeah. And that's where my bigger concern comes from. But if we're going to explore new frontiers, I think that, you know, Maya and Clovis kind of have to be antagonistic forces representing the Vex at that point. Because yeah. Frontiers doesn't just have to mean, oh, we're going to we're going to Reese or we're going to Tora Bottle or this and that or we're going to a new planet. Like, I actually really love a destination that was just us within the Vex network. I think that would be fascinating for an actual like designed location and not just oh a strike or some seasonal activities. Mm -hmm. I think that there there's so many raw possibilities or like oh it's half Vex network half. A uh, Vex star or something, you know, or a moon that they've completely terraformed. Like, there are so many things you could do with storytelling, I think, there. But it's just, it's more of the same. It's like, oh, you're really setting up, you're, like, you're kind of setting up for the future, and it doesn't feel like we're going to get back to this anytime soon, given they didn't tease in last week's articles that, oh, yeah, we're setting up things right away in Echoes. Echo, like, they said that these episodes were supposed to tie up storylines, and I don't feel like anything got tied up this season except for like maybe you put a bow on failsafe being a character in this universe, which did we really need to do that? I mean, I'm always here for failsafe, but like when's we, we've talked about this a few times now. When's the last time we even thought about failsafe? Right. In the context of the story. It right. hates death, maybe. 
we haven't had anything that requires us to go to Nessus in years and years. And like, that's what they keep joking about it. Right. Man, I don't know, man. I, I just, I want them to, I just want them to like, I just want a good story, man. I, I, I really do. Yeah. You know, I want a good story. I, I feel, and I feel like we're going to get that. I feel like we're going to get a good story, but man yeah <laughs> i think like the the vex have the and I, i'm talking in circles but the vex have the ability to be this fascinating enemy race and now that you have things that can communicate for them and actually you know like tell a story be the story carriers like i think it's time to kind of pull the trigger on that but i just how long is it going to be into echoes? Like if it's in our like three, four years, like are the OGs going to care anymore? Right. No, we're not like that's to me. That's the biggest lingering question out of light and dark is like, what the fuck is up with the Vex? Right. You know, like the, even when it comes to like seasonal activities and seasonal storylines after splicer, we really didn't get anything else with the Vex. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about it that way and that's, that's a whole nother thing entirely like, Oh Wow. We really didn't get them in seasonal stuff for a long time. And, oh, you fought them a couple times on, like, Europa during Plunder, and that's about it, I think. Right. They're not all the seasonal content was focused around, you know, the Fallen, the Hive, the Cabal, the Taken. Like, not even really the Taken past arrivals, if we're being honest. Right. At least off, very briefly off the top of my head. <clears throat> yeah. So, like, I get it. You've got other stories. Like, it does feel like the next two with Revenant and Heresy really does feel like that's probably going to bring those storylines to a close, which is great. But Echoes, I think, needed more substance. Like, I, I was playing with Ronnie um, last weekend, and we were talking about it. I, I was just like, man, I, I had to, I had to agree with what he was saying last week, and we we read a lot of Ronnie's comments on the show the vehicle in which echoes was delivered was very poor. The st like the story is there. It, it, if they would have just, I really wish they would have leaned more into like the sci-fi, like out of body horror story that we get told through the vote, the voice logs and through finding the secret chests and things like that. But right. it's too, a little too late by the time you get to that. Yeah. Like, okay. So Maya fled with the echo. Oh boy. Surely that's going to come back up at some point, but who the fuck, who the fuck even knows at this point? Right. Like, so that's insanely frustrating to me. Um, and I, I don't think there's going to be, there's two weeks left. I don't think there's any magical cut scene coming in. The, the epilogue of the season, just basically making you go do encore yet again and collect eight fragments throughout was frustrating at best. Um, and I, I don't say all this to complain and like bitch and moan, but it's just 10 years. I, ex I expect better delivery at this point, especially over a plot thread that like some of us have been theorizing about since like the earliest days of Destiny 1, you know, Maya's Underrush, the Ishtar Collective, things like that. And right. especially the last couple of years, you know, it's been really, I would say ever since we went to Europa, it's been kind of a slow burn, like telling the story of Maya and Chioma and Clovis and like all of them. And it really kicked up a notch with the, with, you know, the discovery that, Oh, they founded Niamuna. Like, Holy shit. That was a genuinely massive revelation for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then the veil containment stories and how they disappeared to the veil and like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like, I just it, it's like I'm in a, it's like I'm in an episode of Lost and I don't like that feeling. Uh season 1 or season 5? I mean both <laughs> good. Uh, I'm feeling like I'm in season 2 right now where mysteries are just being thrown at the wall and very little's getting answered. <laughs> Honestly. So smaller story arcs I think are going to benefit them a lot going forward but yeah, I I'd really like to see this one resolved because I think there's so much potential there. I just don't think they quite know how to tell the story and that's like that's okay just i don't know it, after 10 years i shouldn't still have all these questions remaining about an enemy race that was introduced two-thirds of the way through the original campaign yeah well 
I hope they pull it out, man. I really do. I I do think I do think the idea of Maya Sundresh is interesting. And like you said, it does give a face to a race that we haven't had really any face since really, I, I would say since Atheon, really. But even Atheon was just kind of like a, yeah, not like a real character at that point. You know I mean, the I mean? Atheon, we fought the Gate Lord how many times now? Um, I mean, the Undying Mind is one that comes to mind right away. Remember in Undying, it, believe it or not, there was a story in Undying. We go through like all these different timelines. Every single Vex offensive we did is a different timeline we're going into to kill the Undying Mind. Um, I think that uh, the the uh, the Taken Vex Mind Quoria yeah. is actually really fascinating. But again, that was back in Splicer, and right. it was really like we after during the uh, during the Dark Knight, right? So like. Clovis and Maya are kind of the closest faces we have to this, which I think it's I think it's great to put a human face on that because yeah, you know, Maya became obsessive. Clovis was just evil. Yeah. So I, I think there's two different dichotomies. So uh, I am interested to see what they do there. I'm interested to see what happens with Revenant and Heresy. But th- this season, like overall. I just, especially Act 3 has really just, act, I think Act 1 was actually, like, in terms of activities, Act 1 is probably the best. Um, I don't particularly like Enigma Protocol that much, but I do, I did really like Breach Executable. As as an activity that you could just match make into expert difficulty was really nice. Mm-hmm. But also, the loot was rewarding. I liked yeah. that aspect of it. Enigma Protocol is fine once you've run it a few times. Like, okay. Mm-hmm putting the double perk weapons in there was a good idea but the middle set the middle act act two only having the three battlegrounds was rough and yeah. only only the third one is like of any consequence um in moving the story forward you get that one little mission with saint no cyrus which admittedly you know it it's really it was really cool to go back to the infinite forest i thought that was a really cool nice little touch to go back to Saint's grave, mm-hmm. but that was we we've said like that's really the only like forward movement the story had gotten in six weeks, quote unquote, of storytelling, and then everything else right. is just kind of told through voice logs after that. Like mm-hmm. nothing really happens on screen, and that's really frustrating for a season that is like 18, 19 weeks long. It just kind of leaves us going like, what the fuck, right? So I. It is what it is. Um, I'm not going to cry over spilled milk, but this really has started to feel like Undying 2.0, just like with a better story. We didn't build a Vex portal in the tower this time, so mm-hmm. I consider that to be a win. <laughs> but it's true. I, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need Revenant and Heresy to like really dial up the story content for me here. Um, the story content, but also just like make the activities more fun. Like I don't think. I, I don't think Encore is a bad mission. I think the fact that you have to do it like eight times is bad. That's bad mission design to me. Yeah. And it's just so... It is... They said it's the biggest exotic mission ever, which it fucking is because of all the hiking you do during it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you just you traverse so much of it. I, I really wish that some of the changes that were done to Nessus in this season would stay in the game. I think that would be so cool to see Nessus terraformed. Like it, it's been there for seven years. It's time for a change. Yeah. But um, I don't know how, I don't know how you would go about doing that. I don't, I don't know like if that would be, you know, hard or easy to do permanently or what. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I guess we'll, uh, guess we'll find out i guess so we 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 gotta go vampire hunt now though josh so vampire hunt and uh potion crafting very very excited for uh for potion crafting yes um all right i guess we don't we don't have that much left we we have a couple of uh 
we have a couple of um what you call it we have a couple questions and that's it we have a couple questions and we got a lore corner and that's about all so well should we get into questions then josh yeah i think we should um so pulling up questions uh of course we have two questions from jiggly panda uh well one is a question and one's a hot take apparently uh do you think destiny will ever get back to the heydays or even close to how it used to be yeah dude we were there two and a half months ago yeah I was like, gonna the say final that... shape is literally the best expansion there's ever been in the history of the game yes yeah, i would i would i would argue yes the final <laughs> Now, can it reach that height again? I I don't know with the depleted staff. I think it's going to be very right. hard. Well, we were talking about that. Like the Witch Queen was up, you know, up to that point was like the best. And then we got Lightfall. And we had this. I feel like we have the same. We have this conversation. Like every six months. <laughs> like, yeah. Like I feel like every two to three months after an expansion, we have this talk. And it's not, it's not me getting upset with Panda. It's just it is what it is. Like, yeah. Yes, they have shown that they are capable of doing it. We all wondered after Forsaken, God, can they ever get back to this? And the Witch Queen did it. And yeah. then, oh, Lightfall wasn't good, but oh, and the seasons weren't good either. But oh my God, like this is great. Like I would say, just keep an open mind. Like, and everybody's going to rate things differently. Like, I'm sure there's people who I don't know who they are, but don't rate the final shape as highly as Corey and I do. Yeah. You know? I like I hold Beyond Light in a little bit more esteem than a lot of other folks do. I like my seasonal rankings are all over the place. Like it's did you have fun? Do you think it do you think that the world evolved at all? Do you think that the story evolved? Do you think the characters grew? Like if so, then yeah, sure. It's gonna be up there. Like I I'm actually like talking myself into being excited for Apollo. Um, I think the idea of doing something new is just so fascinating. Like linear, non-linear storytelling, great. We were talking about Prince of Persia and like Metroidvanias earlier. And I think that being an inspiration for the first new expansion in this new initiative called Frontiers is great. I think that's great. I'm very excited for it. I'm interested to see what happens. These next two episodes, I think are going to be bangers. Like we... I was ex- yeah, I was excited for some Vex stuff, but like mm, that kind of fell flat. We know we got two more dungeons coming, you know, before this next one. We don't know anything about a reprised raid yet. Hopefully, that's coming soon. Um, but yeah, we just came off the best raid ever, one of the best exotic missions, if not the best exotic mission in the history of the franchise. I fantastic campaign with lots of epilogue storytelling that was just. Mamma Mia. It was good. Yep. Like, just because Echoes was a letdown doesn't mean that, you know, the final shape is retroactively terrible. Like, the final shape is great. I think we can all agree the final shape was great, but Echoes is underwhelming. And, like, that's fine. Like, again, I really like the storytelling. I like the story in it, but, like, the vehicle is terrible. So, yes, to answer your question, we absolutely can get back to the heydays. We, we were just there. <laughs> we were just there. But this this community is so fickle that the second that we have a down week on something, they're like, ah, they're busting out the pitchforks, and I'm fucking over it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and then with Call of Duty coming out in less than a month, I have a hot take for you guys. I think Ghosts is a top five Call of Duty, and Advanced Warfare is a top ten. I'd love y'all's thoughts on this. Um, as our resident Call of Duty player, um. Ghost is not a top 5, top 10, or even top 15 Call of Duty. It is arguably the worst in the entire franchise to me. I think Ghost was the last one I actually like really played. <laughs> I think the only one that's worse, the only two games that are worse than Ghosts in the entire mainline Call of Duty franchise are legitimately the new Modern Warfare 2 and Modern Warfare 3 in terms of a campaign. Like strictly in terms of a campaign, they're they're pretty damn bad. Um, go, I didn't even like the ghost multiplayer that much. I did not like the extraction mode. I was not a fan. Um, I just, I, as a, as a package, I do not think ghosts was very good. That was the infamous game that was revealed, uh, during the Xbox one announcement where they talked about fish and underwater tech for like 10 minutes, mm-hmm. uh, which has never sat well with me. Um, I God, dude, what a what a rough fucking game. Advanced Warfare, however, I will absolutely agree with you. That is a top ten Call of Duty, one hundred percent. If I had to like just rapid fire off my top five favorite CODs, uh, I, I'm an I'm an older COD player. You guys can understand. I was in, I was in high school when Modern Warfare came out. 
dating myself a little bit here, but uh, like it's it's Modern Warfare, it's Modern Warfare Two, the OGs, the two OGs. It's Call of Duty Two, which is to this day one of the greatest launch titles of all time. I there maybe is like four launch games that have ever been better for a home console, and they're like all they all have the Legend of Zelda in them, I think, or Halo. I don't think that's too much of a hot take, personally. Uh, I would probably put Black Ops 2 on that list in my top five. I really liked Black Ops 2. That was the last one I played seriously, I think. I came along to Black Ops 2 really late. I also played it on the Wii U. so But I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. Um, and then for number five, I'm going to say for me, it's either the original or it's the, the original 2003 COD, or it's... Um, I'm really tempted to put World at War or Black Ops 1 here. God, just... The, the, Modern Warfare 3 is also really good. It's, it's just like playing a dumb dumbass Michael Bay movie. Yeah. Um, I would put... I'd probably put either uh, the original COD or I would put Modern Warfare 3 there. Like, just, God, those those were so good. Those, those first Modern Warfare 3... Modern Warfare games are really good. I should say all these rankings are done without me having played um, Modern Warfare 2019. I've not played that. Uh, I also did enjoy uh, the parts I played at Vanguard. I liked Vanguard. Uh, not from a multiplayer standpoint, obviously. I don't play World War II games in multiplayer. But um, I did actually like the campaign for Vanguard. Um, Black Ops Cold War is interesting. Um, I haven't played enough of it to be able to rank yet, but yeah. It's basically just like if uh, if Vince Amp- if Vince Sampella worked on it, it's probably in my top five. Let's be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, he of course got fired after Modern Warfare Two. That whole catastrophe happened with him and Jason West. They went on to go form Respawn, make Titanfall, and all that. But mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. Th- this is going to be an old reference that Corey will understand. But you know, Call of Duty was born out of Medal of Honor Allied Assault. Mm-hmm. When they like, left EA to go form Infinity Ward. <laughs> they left EA to go make Infinity Ward because they wanted to do that, but on a grander scale. Mm-hmm. And we got Call of Duty. Yep. So, and like, you know, I said, you know, COD, COD 2 launched with the 360. It was the first real Call of Duty on consoles. We had had Finest Hour the year before, mm-hmm. um, which was not good, by the way. <laughs> Finest Hour is rough. It's what about what about Big Red One? Big Josh? Red One is even worse. <laughs> um, I remember the first time Treyarch made a Call of Duty. It was Call of Duty Three, and I was just like, "Oh my god, this is gonna be terrible!" And it was. Uh, I'm sorry, nothing made me want to play as the Polish Army in World War Three in World War Two. Oh, but I heard they did so good. They touted that there were four different factions to play as, and it's like, "Oh, who's the fourth? Oh, the the Polish." <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, that's a thing that happened. Um. Oh. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know, man. Um. But I. I'm one of those weirdos who loves the Call of Duty campaigns. Uh. I like sometimes you just want something that's la- big, loud, turn your brain off, fun, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what those campaigns have always been for me. Up until Modern Warfare oh. two and three, I did not enjoy either of those. Well, the thing. The thing They're is, terrible. I. I'm not interested in playing the multiplayer anymore, just because. Yeah. I don't have time, and I don't want to pay seventy dollars for a campaign. And so when they start rolling out on Game Pass, maybe I'll revisit some of these. And uh... yeah, I uh, I am very excited for Black Ops Six, though. Like all all things considered, I am very excited mm-hmm. for Black Ops Six. I really enjoyed the uh, the betas that we got this last month. Uh, played a lot of that with uh, with my boy Ray. Uh, we got really into it. I'm very excited for the campaign. I think the campaign footage has looked awesome. It is a truly different Call of Duty campaign, mm-hmm. which interests me. But yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's. I think this game is just the boost that that brand needs. Um, I still wish they would take a few years off, but I understand when you move thirty million copies without even blinking, you're going to keep them coming. So, um, uh, God, dude, I just now I just want to play Call of Duty Two. I really love Call of Duty Two. Like in terms of a World War Two game, that's probably the best one I've ever played. It's like that and Medal of uh, Medal of, uh, Medal of Honor Allied Assault might be the second best. Like v- Vince Sampella is a dude who knows fucking World War Two, uh, especially the the D Day landings and things like that. Um, I I really 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 like number two though. Like when you think about 
the best launch titles of like the last 20 years. It's like, I don't know, Halo, Breath of the Wild, Twilight Princess, and this. Like, those might be the four best launch games of the last 20, 25 years. And you, you, if you went to 25, you would have to include the Dreamcast lineup, which was fucking bonkers at launch. But, like, and at that point, it's like Sonic Adventure is on that list. So, mm-hmm. I don't know. Just Now I'm getting all nostalgic, and I really, really, God, I love Modern Warfare 1. Modern Warfare 1 is still, like, one of the best FPS campaigns of all time. There's, yeah. there's no doubt about that. The, the story of Price and Soap is so good. So good. I, I like to two is that, but like on a bigger scale, a little bit more like kind of free free movement, I guess, in some of the levels. Um, we all re- we all remember um, the uh, doing the the fucking uh, airplane boneyard level. Um, again, one of the one of the great FPS levels of all time. Uh, just. Got great games, great games. Call of Duty used to be so fucking good, man. Like I still, th- I think it's fine in terms of the multiplayer. Like, you know what you're getting at this point if you're buying it. I say as someone who bought both two and three for Modern Warfare after not having bought one since Ghosts, I like I get it. But um, I hope they go back to Advanced Warfare to finish out Panda's question. I, I want them to go back to Advanced Warfare. I think the Exo suits made things very interesting, and I think Exo Zombies in particular was fascinating. Uh. We already got to Cade's question about uh, the war of attrition with the cricket in my uh, in my air vents, but um, Cade also left a uh, a nice comment here for us that I want to read to everybody. Uh, the past few weeks have been extremely tough for me uh, as a father of twin boys that are age four. One of my sons was recently diagnosed with epilepsy in and out of the hospital to try and get medicine right to help eliminate the seizures. And it's taken a toll on me. No appetite, no motivation to do anything. Back and forth to the hospital. This pod has been my happy place every Friday since this started happening. Thank you, Josh, Corey, and the Tower Casuals community for helping me smile at least once a week. And you know what, guys? That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. That's why, uh, you know, I, I took it, you know, really seriously when uh when we were getting some comments about like oh my god are you, all, are you just gonna be like downers like is, is the pod happier this week like man realistically like there's gonna be weeks where it's not you know where you know hey we, we've got shit going on or there's stuff going on you know in the world of this game like stuff's happening at Bungie, stuff's happening with you know our favorite creatives are being fired you know mm-hmm. we're gonna react appropriately like we'd be doing you a disservice if we didn't but uh it's comments like this to make it worth it you know, yeah. I uh, I take that really seriously, but you know, we are uh, we are all hoping for the best for your son as you guys navigate this. Um, I I get it, man. My uh, my girlfriend went through some uh, some pretty bad chest pains a few Christmases ago um, while we were doing this show. Actually, it was about a year and a half into the show. Year and a half in, yeah, year and a half uh, into the show, we. Uh, we were going through some things and, um, you know, they, they were trying to rule out, you know, autoimmune diseases and things like that. She was just, you know, ridiculously sick and it took us a long time to get the right medication. That, and it took a lot of strain on us. So, uh, like, I get it. Uh, no, I obviously haven't been exactly in the same situation. I can't even imagine what it's like as a parent. Uh, Corey can probably talk about that a little bit better than I can, but I get it, man. Um, you know, health concerns are, they're hard to navigate, you know, so if we can provide a little bit of an escape for, you know, even the hour, hour and a half that we do the show, that's, uh, that means a lot to us. Yeah. I, um, I don't know if I've ever told this on a show before, but just to try to relate to you a little bit. Um, so, I mean, obviously I've, I've got my own mental stuff. I've talked about that before, but Mm -hmm. the problem with that, is that a lot of it is genetic and my six year old daughter is going through a lot of things and nights are rough sometimes. And, um, there are days where I just don't want to do anything, but you push through because you got to be there for your kids. You know, you gotta try (laughs) and it's hard. I, I, a hundred percent understand and I feel for you and I feel what you're going through. And I know it's different than what I'm going through, but it's, you know, 
I, I sympathize, empathize. I don't remember which is the right word, but um, you know, it's empathize. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, we're doing our we're doing our best to take your mind off of it for an hour and a half or so every week or mm-hmm. so. You know, so hang in there. It'll it'll get better. Um, it's it's always that initial shock of the diagnosis that is you know kind of the i want to say i want to say the worst part of these things and then you'll learn how to handle it and then it'll become a routine and and you'll get through it um some days are definitely harder than others but um you know it, it'll get it'll get better um just be there for your kids man yeah uh, on that note, we're going to move into uh, lore corner. It's just, I, there's no good way to transition out of that. There's just isn't. Um, we, we have a lore corner tonight from the book Polyphony, which is what you get for doing the uh, the radio messages in the helm. This is the final page of that uh, lore book called uh, Tech Support. Incoming message. Failsafe system alert pulled her attention from Nimbus, who was excitedly pacing the helm while delivering a spirited recounting of the last Iron Banner finals. Saladin had been routing the feats to Niamuna, and the Cloud Strider was thoroughly enraptured by the high drama. Judging by Failsafe's internal chronometer, entirely too enraptured. She shrewdly routed the message alerts to her external display screen. Nimbus, buddy, she began. Hint taken. Nimbus grinned, spreading their huge hands wide. I'll let you get back to your whole being a ship thing. If you see Osiris, tell him Jizu Calorando is looking for an interview about his sick bird hat. Or no, say that the Cloud Arc is losing integrity and only the biorhythms from like a truly old and decrepit dude will save it. I'm on it, Fail said and pushed an ace and ASC2 image of a thumbs up to her display. Nimbus laughed and gave Failsafe two enormous finger guns as they transmatted out. Never mind. Failsafe accessed her messages. She batch approved the bounty request from Guardian, still scouting Nessus for the remains of the Conductor's Vex. She puzzled next over a message from House Light Scribe Ido, as it did not appear to contain any discernible requests. She marked it for a non-urgent reply and sorted it into one of her new subfolders, Socialization Platonic. Another message was scheduled was a scheduled reminder to familiarize herself with the helm systems, which were woefully underprepared for the kind of worst case scenario she had encountered with the Exodus Black. She would have to update the safety systems, bring emergency transmit relays online, calculate possible terrestrial touchdown sites in the unlikely event of a forced landing. Unquestionably important work, but for the first time she felt like it could wait. Failsafe eagerly processed the next series of critical system messages. One unintended but entirely welcome consequence of the increased Guardian activity on Nessus was that the resident fallen were being actively discouraged from raiding her wreckage. Without the constant incursions, her power systems were slowly beginning to build a reserve charge. Low power alert, 6%, the warnings blared, and Failsafe beeped with satisfaction. There was a sudden burst of gold flame, a scattering of reflected figures, and Osiris transmatted onto the helm. Failsafe he said brusquely as he walked towards her console. Osiris, she replied, and opened a swirling readout of polynomial spileys. Osiris and Saint had been journeying into the Nessus Vex network and searching for the conductor, one simulated branch at a time. Osiris highlighted portions of 17 intersecting wavelengths. So it is cleared, he commanded, and failsafe changed their color to a bright lime green. Osiris zoomed the display out, and the green became a pixel-wide dot amidst a swaling fractal triangle of the network. Seventeen down, Failsafe said. Infinity to go. Osiris sighed wearily in agreement. And the odds that those seventeen have already been overwritten are? He asked. Failsafe gave a low-pitched beep. Do you need the real math on that? Because it's a ninety-nine point a whole lot of nines. Osiris shook his head. She's somewhere in the network, along with the echo of command. And even though she knows the chances of finding her are impossibly small, Saint is continuing to search. He absently drummed his hands on Failsafe's control panel. What do you think he'll do if he finds her? She asked. I believe he will. How should I put this? Osiris said softly. The faintest of smiles played over his face. Saint doesn't have much patience for anyone who makes those he cares about feel helpless. 
Osiris's gaze wandered to the research bays, and Failsafe dispensed a synthesized mealworm into Captain Jacobson's enclosure. The proto-frog blinked slowly, then devoured the grub in one clumsy gulp. Osiris nodded in approval. Generate a fresh scent of network coordinates, please, he said. And Failsafe whirred in response as numbers filled her screen. She sent into Osiris's data pad with a reassuring tone, and he turned to leave. Osiris, she said. Nimbus, Miss is hanging out with you. You ought to visit him sometime. Osiris tightened his lips. Very well, he said. Then he hesitated. Failsafe, be thankful that incoming message. The alert filled Failsafe's display screen and Osiris stopped himself with a half shake of his head and a smirk. I'll leave you to it, he said, and vanished in another flash of golden fire. Failsafe sorted through her new messages. Low power alert, 7%, read the critical warning, and she dismissed it happily. So first off, how are how is Nimbus and Osiris transmitting transmitting onto the helm when they don't have ghosts? Is this just like technology that everyone has that I have, have like completely blocked out of my mind? It, I mean, it must be because um, how did Nimbus get all? How did Nimbus just click fast travel all the way from uh, Neptune? It's that surfboard man. I don't think he's riding through the galaxy like the Silver Surfer. Like, the one Cloud Strider is just hanging out on the fucking helm watching Iron Banner finals. Jesus Christ, guys. Um, but on a more serious note, I do I do really love this because it failsafe feels like she has a purpose again. And it really left me uncomfortable and annoyed when basically the summation of the end of the season for failsafe was, well, you guys don't need me anymore. I'm going to go back to Nessus. Bye. And basically just, like, kind of pieced out. I think this gives her renewed focus. And also seeing that her reserve power is finally going up for the first time since she crashed, like, a thousand years ago is great to see. Like, failsafe, I do think, is going to continue to be a part of the story. I'd be very surprised if she was not permanently on the helm going forward. I think you have a golden opportunity here. Uh, for for the AI. Um, and I mean, she's one of our only links to the Golden Age, too. So being a Golden Age AI, which is interesting. Um, I think, you know, especially if you're going to tell stories with, like, about the Vex, like she, you know, she's a great ally to have there, obviously. Um, I love the idea of her just batch approving everything, too. I think that's absolutely hilarious. Um, the message from Ido uh just filing that into so platonic socialization is about the most fail safe thing i can think of to do here um i find that very funny i, I like to think that uh ido has argued with her in the past there is there is another um passage i think it's number eight where uh ido requests to travel with uh saint and osiris to nessus and Saint is, like, absolutely not and basically goes into, like, dad mode with her and is like, oh, uh, fuck no. Like, her and o him and Osiris are like, uh, no, you can hang out on the helm, though. We mm -hmm. we could really use you on the helm. Uh, so I, I suspect Ido will be chilling on the helm uh, next season. But uh, I, I just, I love lore bits like this because it, in a whole swath of little tidbits that we get we find out that iron banner apparently has finals number one number two it gets broadcast somewhere other than the tower and keitel's ship like we now know that it also gets shown in the uh elixir quarter and now it's being shown on niamuna like where the fuck else are they streaming these matches at uh right. i think that's hilarious uh Putting Nimbus back in the lore also just makes me hopeful that they are going to have a role at some point. Um, just because Lightfall wasn't received well doesn't mean you can't use the characters from Lightfall. Now, it probably doesn't make sense to use Nimbus in either of the next two episodes. But I actually think it would have made a lot of sense to have used them to some degree here, considering they're on Niamuna fighting off a Vex invasion. Just my two cents. Um... Other little tidbits, Osiris going through and mapping, like, every single branch he can possibly find uh, on Nessus trying to lead to the Conductor is another, like, kind of interesting tidbit that plays into what we were just talking about. Like, that's where you really need, like, Asher checking the Vexnet, in all honesty. Like, you need to make contact there and have him doing that so that, you know, 
the guy who doesn't have a ghost isn't going out there and doing this. Who's also right. like a million years old. Um, right. So I think that's cool. And I think, I think it's really interesting that Failsafe actually understands that like Nimbus just wants to hang out with their friends. They don't like they're, they are lonely and like Failsafe, I think finally grasps that. And I don't know if she would have at the beginning of the season, but you know, she notes it in some of the dialogue that we get that she finally feels like she's part of a crew again. Like she has a purpose. And I love that. I, I think like, it's funny that an AI gets some of the best character growth, but it's also a character like that. Nothing has been done with since vanilla D one really. Like there's been bare minimum since then. Yeah. Like we basically visit her and tell her that Cade was dead. And that was about it. Like we genuinely do not go to Nessus for anything. And if we did, she wasn't involved in the stories that were being told. So, um, yeah, just, again, little spice of life things that I I like seeing, especially at the end of a season. I think that uh, it gives us a little bit more context on our uh, on our favorite characters. So. Spice of life. The spice of life. Um, Well. That's going to do it for a lore corner. Should we uh, should we head on out of here? Yeah, I guess uh, we should probably get on out of here, huh? Uh, speaking of spicy, uh, I want to thank everybody out there for watching and or listening to this episode of Tower Casuals. You can find us on Fridays on your podcast service of choice. Check out uh, Xbox Casuals, uh, our Xbox podcast, which you can find every other week. Um, Josh, thank you for your time as always. Where can we find you? Uh, Twitter, Josh underscore Finn, two wins, baby. Well, two ends. You can find me at I am Corn HD on all them socials. Uh, check us out, rate us, review us, all those things. And uh, thanks so much for watching and or listening. And until next time, we love you. Goodbye.